today. Thank you, Jason. Um, we have some comments so far in the chat and the latest one is, um, oh, and we've got a really long one. Interesting. Um, all right, fantastic presentation. Um, having dogged SAS powers consultation process, I can say that the GGPPA Act decision has been influential on SAS power. I don't think they would have been as ambitious on increased renewables without the pollution price. Their plan is a significant increase in wind power, further transition from coal to gas, and hoping for M SMRs to come online in the mid to late 2030s. Um, what I find troubling is that SASC plans to increase oil production in our province by 25%, and they are still building new natural gas-fired power generation. Saskatchewan betting on BAU rather than doing their part on mitigation seems to me to be worthy of legal action against our government and SASC power. Your thoughts? That was quite lengthy. If you want to take a moment and read through it in the chat, that'll give some people time to answer their own questions as well. Uh, so shall I respond? Sure. If you have thoughts on that. Uh, oh, absolutely. That comment. Sure. So thanks. Uh, thanks, Glenn. And nice to hear from you. Um, so I have no doubt, just as a, just by way of clarification, I have no doubt that the GGPPA uh, will and has already had an impact um, across the Canada, uh, across Canada and different jurisdictions in terms of the level of ambition. Uh, I want to just differentiate between the impact of the legislation which was passed in 2018 and then the impact of the court's decision. And uh, the, I think the, the act is influential. It's not going to be nearly enough, even at a $170 a ton, if we get there by 2030, it's not going to be enough. Uh, the best independent estimates of the social, the actual social cost of carbon are well over $200 American a ton. So that still leaves a gap, which is effectively, as you well know, uh, a subsidy uh, for fossil fuel production. But my point really was that the, uh, to use this phrase that my students uh, sometimes use, it was the Supreme Court of Canada's decision that was a nothing burger because it simply reaffirmed uh, what, what the majority of the uh, Saskatchewan Court of Appeal, a 3-2 majority held in 2019, and what a 4-1 to one majority of the Ontario Court of Appeal held in 2019 as well, and what all serious legal scholars, even before the case or the constitutional question was referred to the courts, uh, concluded this was basic constitutional law 101. There was no serious merit to the lawsuit. Uh, what, the, what, the, what the legal challenge did was effectively give both uh, the provincial governments and the federal government, uh, you know, basically a three year delay to just say, well, we're fighting this battle over the constitution in, in the courts. And really during that time, uh, when you go and look back at what the level of discussion was like uh, in terms of climate change policy, there wasn't much of one. Uh, we, we ended up getting distracted by what was actually called the Saskatchewan strategy of continuing uh, a fight over public policy priorities through the courts. Now, to your point, and so that's the distinction. Yes, I think the legislation will be impactful. Uh, we know that putting a price on carbon uh, tends to reduce carbon emissions. That's really basic economics 101. Of course, the question has, the questions are always when it comes to carbon pricing, is the price high enough to change demand and supply? And is it universal in coverage? And in no jurisdiction in the world can you say yes to both of those questions, but that's, that's neither here nor there. It's just to make the point that we're going to need a broad portfolio of climate mitigation policies. Now, I, I share your dismay, Glenn, with respect to both Saskatchewan's um, very public plans to continue oil and natural gas production 
and not only that, but to not really aggressively move to phase out coal. Um, I would I would say that uh, I, I feel the same level of dismay uh, toward the federal government uh, for its own ongoing uh, support through uh, direct and indirect subsidies for increased oil and gas production. Um, and, and now to your question that it, it, it's worthy of, uh, or it merits legal action. Well, we already do, as you well know, of course, uh, have a case that's pending in the courts. It, the LaRose um, youth class action case. So for, for everybody's background, uh, 15 youth across Canada uh, launched a case against the federal government, uh, suing the federal government for a breach of its constitutional rights to life, liberty, and security of the person, and also uh, um, generate intergenerational equality uh, for its 30-year inaction on, on climate change. And now, that, ca that case uh, you know, received a setback um, last fall in federal court. A federal court judge granted the federal government's motion to dismiss the case. Uh, the case is now pendently, uh, currently pending before the uh, Federal Court of Appeal, uh, where it has zero chance of succeeding, uh, not because of the legal merits, but because the Federal Court of Appeal just doesn't have any appetite uh, to think about the law in that way. So an interesting question will be, and we should know the answer to this, and this is what's so, I think, frustrating about using litigation and constitutional litigation in particular as a means of trying to compel our governments uh, to act on the knowledge that they already have and have had for decades, we should know in about two years uh, whether or not the Supreme Court of Canada will decide to hear an appeal from the Federal Court of Appeal in, in the LaRose case. So my own view, and I am a recovering litigator myself, and uh, uh, my day job is as a law professor, um, I'm highly skeptical of the ability to advance public policy of this kind because it, it is so transformational and so structural and all-encompassing uh, through the courts. I just, I really don't think that Canadian courts have either the appetite or frankly, the understanding that's required to issue the kind of legal orders and remedies that would help push uh, our governments to act faster and, uh, and more radically. And I mean, I would just refer you back to paragraphs 175 and 199 of the Supreme Court of Canada's March decision with respect to the, the GGPPA and you know, clearly the court has very, very little understanding of the um, sector-wide approach that's going to be required to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in, in any uh, industrial heavy emitting country like Canada. So, you know, on the legal merits, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's illegal. Uh, what our governments are doing. Uh, whether that is the best strategic use of our resources and uh, the best way to mobilize public opinion, I'm, I remain and I grow uh, increasingly skeptical uh, about the utility of that approach. Okay, um, next question we have. In terms of each province's fair share of emission reduction, what do you think of the argument that it's easier for some provinces to reduce emissions by a given percentage than for others because of the nature of their economy? So I think, I think, um, that is certainly something that should be factored in to a real world grown up discussion about what that's going to look like in terms of, now it's important to understand to just take a step back. 
if we're thinking about, and we absolutely should be thinking about carbon budgets, um, we have to first start with a global carbon budget. And but what I mean by that, and we have various estimates of how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions the world can emit to have certain probabilities of remaining within certain temperatures. So for example, if, you, if we want, uh, according to the IPCC's latest report on the physical basis of climate change released in August, if we want a 50% 50 50 chance, so just even odds of meeting the, keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial norm, that means we have 500 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions left as a globe forever that can be emitted. If we go over that, then, you know, then we're losing that 50-50 chance. Now, I don't know about you, but a 50-50 chance doesn't sound amazing, right? So what about uh, a 66% chance? Well, then the, the global carbon budget goes down to 400 billion tons or, or, or 40 gigat uh, 400 gigatons. And if we wanted an 83% chance, it goes down to 300 billion tons. And those are conservative estimates uh, that, that assume the best for us in terms of underlying climate model sensitivity. But independent scholars say the remaining carbon budget is likely much lower than that. So the way Greta Thunberry likes to put it, so she made a short film in advance of COP and she played a song, uh, maybe some of you remember it, it emerged out of South Korea about six years ago called Gangnam Style. And it's not a great song, but it's a memorable one. And she said, well, and that's the period of time moving forward that if we continue with business as usual uh, emissions, we will blow through uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius carbon budget. So you have to begin there. And then you have to have a discussion at the international level based upon historical cumulative emissions and current emissions and also respective capacities to mitigate what each country's share should be. So Canada has to have its own share. And then within Canada, we'd have to divvy that up amongst provinces because the federal government itself isn't itself a big emitter. The emissions come from the provinces and territories. Now I do, I agree that uh, parts of that um, you know, will there, there will have to be some discussion about what a transition will look like. But I would also say that, you know, the, the activist and writer Bill McKibben loves to say, you know, the, the atmospheric physics of the greenhouse effect, they don't negotiate and they don't care about our little compromises and they don't care that it's harder for Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, to reduce their emissions than it is for Quebec or, or for BC, even though BC is still doing a lousy job despite its in, inherent advantages. But what it does mean though, is that we need to be uh, thinking about and legislating a just transition act. And that would be part of uh, thinking about what do we do with these industries? Um, do we nationalize them? Do we pay them to transition? Do we cover some of what their stranded assets will be? And those will be really difficult discussions because um, there'll be norms and values that'll come into play. A pragmatic approach would look at would look at the issue just from the perspective of what is most effective in reducing emissions as much as possible, as quickly as possible. But you know, there's there's uh, powerful entrenched interests at play. Uh, there's public support that needs to be brought on board. So I think it's going to be uh, a complicated discussion. So all of that is to say, yes, I absolutely agree. That should be part of the, the discussion, but the discussion has to happen at multiple levels geopolitically. Uh, and it has to account for, for, uh, for um, you know, multiple issues. And respective capacities is, is, is part of that. You know, at the same time though, and I would be remiss if I didn't give my own view, which is this isn't a new issue, right? We've known about this for a long time. And one of my favorite examples is this report uh, uh, produced uh, by a committee in Alberta that was charged with the task 
of looking into and giving recommendations for the diversification of Alberta's economy away from its oil, gas, and coal focus. You know, the, because the idea was maybe we shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in, in just that one basket. And the report came back and the title is something along the lines of uh, who needs baskets when you've got oil and gas. It basically said, we're in, we're, we're in a fossil fuels energy superpower and that's our advantage and we're going to press it. So in many ways, you know, uh, the leadership in these jurisdictions has been doing a disservice by not using like Norway, which is of course the classic example of using its oil and gas wealth uh, by starting a, a sovereign wealth fund in 1990 uh, that it's been using to decarbonize its, its own society. Um, so, you know, the jurisdictions that haven't done that will have to bear a little bit of responsibility because it's not like we suddenly woke up in 2021 and realized, oh gosh, combusting, you know, fossil fuels uh, produces greenhouse gas emissions, which traps infrared radiation in the atmosphere and warms the planet and disrupts the climate. We've, we've, we've known about this for decades. So, you know, it's going to be all which is to say, I agree with that comment, but it's a very, very complicated discussion that we need to start having now. Uh, there's very little discussion of carbon budgets in uh, popular media discourse. And that really needs to change because whether or not we acknowledge it, it, it exists, it's, it's there. Uh, so, you know, our policies, if they're going to be meaningful and science-based, have to account, have to account for that. I will just add very, very super quickly, though, that is, to go back to, uh, to, to Glenn's initial question, that is also the, one of the challenges with using the courts to try and do this. So the, the 15 youth plaintiffs in the LaRose class action have asked uh, the court to demand, uh, to basically to order to direct the federal government to create a new climate plan that's based on its fair share of the remaining global carbon budget. Well, Canada can't do that absent an international agreement. And so that would, you know, what the youth plaintiffs have asked for, I understand it, but it's asking for something that really the court really couldn't do without usurping, um, you know, the legislative role of, of the federal government. But that said, you know, the federal government and the governments of uh, the rest of the world, especially the, the, the countries that are historically most responsible uh, for carbon emissions. Because remember, methane, of course, is a short-lived pollutant, very potent, but carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years. So, you know, Canada is in the top 10 of countries as greenhouse gas emitters when it comes to historical cumulative greenhouse gas emissions. We've become rich based on our historical cumulative greenhouse gas emissions. So that means that we have a larger responsibility to play as a country. And that's going to mean that uh, provinces will have a larger responsibility. And that's what really uh, cuts against that comment that Saskatchewan makes by saying, you know, we're doing our bit, but, you know, this requires a global effort. Well, it requires leadership from rich countries with really high institutional and technological capacity. And I really wish Saskatchewan would use its uh, uh, amazing, a, its amazing capacity for renewable energy, but also its technological capacity to be, you know, being the change in the world that we want to see, as opposed to like, doubling down on business as usual and waiting for other countries to lead, basically being a free rider. That's a pretty difficult position to accept. I think, Glenn, you're right that it's illegal. It's definitely unethical. I'm going to jump down to um, a question and then work back up because I think this one might build off of what you were just saying. What are your thoughts on youth suing corporations as they did governments? Right. Well, uh, <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, it's complicated, right? It's, uh, um, it's complicated for a couple of reasons. So 
Um, you know, the first thing that I have to say, like as a lawyer, you know, my question would be, and as somebody who used to practice corporate law as well, but entirely apart from that, um, you know, what law is it that the corporate, so say you were gonna sue major oil and gas producers, what law are they breaking that you wanna sue them for? Because you can't take them to court because you don't like them. And you can't take them to court, you know, because like, you know, on Twitter, when people say, please be better, you know, that doesn't ground, a cause of action in court. So that's one, like what's the, what's the legal basis going to be? Because oil and gas production are, are not only legal, but you know, in terms of the global energy mix, right? Um, oil, gas, and coal make up 80% of the global energy mix still today. So, you know, one of the, the, the interesting like good news, bad news stories over the last decade is that renewable energy generation has been outstripping oil and gas in terms of new generation and the costs have been falling, but it's not replacing, uh, it's not replacing fossil fuels because overall energy demand continues to go up. So it's just helping meet new demand. So to relate that back to the question, if you're gonna sue oil and gas majors, um, they're responding with a product that's entirely legal uh, to demand. And so now, so maybe the argument is this though, maybe the argument is, well, oil and gas companies like Exxon, like Total and others knew in you know, the 1970s because they were doing their own internal research, uh, they knew that uh, combusting more and more fossil fuels uh, was going to uh, warm the planet and disrupt the climate. And um, they hid that information. And in fact, in the 1990s, uh, they be, some of those major corporations based in the United States began to s purposely sow doubt and uncertainty uh, publicly. Um, but to me, uh, there's, you know, from a, unfortunately, from a strict legal perspective, there are two big problems even with that. One, they didn't have any unique information. Their climate scientists, climate scientists working for ExxonMobil in the 1970s, were trained at American universities who learned from atmospheric uh, physicists and chemists uh, who were already doing this research. So they didn't know anything that the government didn't already know and hadn't been told by scientists. That's number one. And number two, um, you know, as for the argument that they're misleading public relations and disinformation and greenwashing campaigns has delayed meaningful science-based climate policy. Um, I find that hard to swallow. We've known since 2014, 2015, what Exxon knew. That was a whole hashtag for a while, hashtag Exxon knew. Well, now, now it's hashtag, we know that hashtag Exxon knew. And where has been that massive public uprising and demands uh, for action? I haven't seen it. And here's one third um, setback or, or something to consider uh, about um, using the courts to sue corporations. You may have heard of uh, another, um, um, you know, a, a court decision in Holland uh, requiring Royal Dutch Shell to speed up its decarbonization. Well, what has Royal Dutch Shell done? First, it appealed the decision. Okay. Second, it divested assets to other jurisdictions that are beyond the reach of the Dutch courts. And third, it's contemplating moving to England. So um, one, one problem with uh, suing corporations is it's based on the particular territory. There isn't a global court that you can go after them in. So if you wanna sue a Canadian oil and gas company, um, and even if you got a verdict, a successful verdict, if they divest all their assets from Canada, um, you may have a, 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 you may have more difficulty uh, getting a court in another jurisdiction to recognize and enforce that judgment, and it could take years. And here's the other thing, um, and I know a lot of people think about well. 
we should model climate change litigation against corporations, oil and gas majors on tobacco litigation. Well, that litigation is still ongoing in Canada and has been ongoing for decades now. Um, these corporations have billions and billions of dollars and they would sooner pay corporate lawyers to keep these cases in the courts than settle them out of court. And so when we're thinking about, we need, and the IPCC has been very clear about this, we need rapid far reaching changes this decade to be on a trajectory for net zero emissions by 2050 and then emissions removal uh, toward 2100. We likely don't have time to invest a lot of strategic resources into corporate litigation, which could you know, easily take decades and in the end, not achieve the result that we want. We might, however, start thinking about, are there ways to transform oil and gas companies? Because the reality is the, the changes that we need to make in terms of renewable energy, and, and, and we can talk about where nuclear fits uh, in the mix as well, but we need to make massive engineering and logistical changes to scale up and transmit renewable energy. And the industry that knows how to do energy at scale in the world is the oil and gas industry. I mean, they're experts at that, right? Along with power utilities. Um, suing them, although I get it, uh, you know, conceptually, uh, you know, my heart is with you, um, but I don't know that that's the most pragmatic strategy for the use of those resources. Uh, but we are, it's clear that we are going to have to use some form of compulsion. If anybody watched the uh, recent congressional hearings uh, last month in the United States where oil and gas uh, CEOs uh, testified before uh, an oversight committee of the US Congress, um, you know, they're not telling the truth about what they're doing, what they're investing in and what their transition plans are. They're actively engaged in greenwashing and misinformation, and they have no plans to move away from oil and gas production anytime soon because they have uh, so much already invested awaiting returns on those investments, which take a long time. So we are going to have to think strategically about what to do with that industry, but I'm not sure that suing it is the most productive way forward, which might be counterintuitive coming from uh, a law professor, but I'm kind of a, a litigation skeptic. Uh, parties rarely get those full convincing wins uh, that they think they're going to get uh, when they go to court. That's the exception, not the rule. Anyway. Um, well spoke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to take a pause here. Okay. Um, it's eight o'clock. So I would like to say quickly, uh, and if Carol, you're out there, you might have more information about this, but there will be no presentation in December. Um, we will be uh, back in January though. And, and Carol, do you want to speak a little bit about what that's going to look like? Right. On January 25th, on a Tuesday evening, um, there'll be a, another Zoom webinar. And this one will be on local food and reducing food waste. And uh, the speaker will be um, a person who, who works in that area, Catherine uh, uh, Baudin. So uh, I hope you can join us on uh, January uh, 25th. And um, there won't be any um, sustainability speakers uh, event in, um, uh, in, in December. So I think we can go back to the questions. Yeah, we've got two more questions. Jason, how are you feeling? Okay, perfect. Um, and this will be the last chance, everybody. We're doing, we're coming down. Uh, all right. How can the Canadian federal government funds be used in Saskatchewan? to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. For example, can funds be used to develop wind power um, expertise? Yes, uh, so 
you know, the the best, uh, the, the most effective lever financially that the federal government has is uh, subsidies. So what it what it should be doing is uh, not phasing out, but eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. So we should not be providing either directly uh, and directly is, you know, direct investments, cash infusements, or indirectly tax benefits, uh, sorry, you know, or tax exemptions or tax exclusions, um, uh, money to help aid fossil fuel production. Uh, the science is very clear about this. Even the very conservative International Energy uh, Agency has said in its 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius cap pathway, there's no new oil, gas, or coal production or exploration after 2021. So basically, we've got another month left. And that is it. What, what the model, and that is a conservative model. There's a, a paper that was published in 2019 that shows that for based on all ongoing and planned oil, gas, and coal production as of 2018, even what had already been committed, if it were to run its full lifespan, would overshoot our 1.5 degrees Celsius budget. Meaning not only do we have to stop right now exploring for new oil and gas reserves, whether offshore or underground, um, uh, but we might have to also, and in fact, we are going to have to retire early uh, many of the existing. So going back to uh, the first question, you know, uh, that was posed earlier on, uh, noting with dismay Saskatchewan's plan to significantly increase uh, oil and gas production in its uh, 2020 to 2030 growth plan. Um, you know, that is just flatly inconsistent with uh, climate science, without a doubt. And it's just very irresponsible. Um, so, to the extent that the federal government either indirectly or directly subsidizes, financially supports oil and gas development, it should A, stop that. So just stop. That's easy to do. Just don't do it anymore. That's low hanging fruit. Uh, and I would just point out that uh, in a meeting of the G20 in Turkey in 2009, the G20 members committed to phasing out fossil fuels and they uh, subsidies, and they still haven't done it. So that's, that's number one. And then two, what it could then do is it could redirect those subsidies to renewable energy production. And it could also, the federal government could also use its jurisdiction uh, for interprovincial, uh, not just pipelines, but power lines, right? So the federal government should be directly investing in uh, new power lines that we're going to need both east west but also there are great opportunities for a province like saskatchewan to sell renewable energy south of the border to the united states and to link up with uh the western grid so but that's going to require uh the infusion of a lot of money the federal government should be investing in that instead of itself investing in natural gas production uh, on the hopes that you know, it, it's going to be able to utilize carbon capture, utilization and sequestration to make blue hydrogen, uh, which is, you know, a really risky bet, um, uh, let alone uh, green hydrogen, which really doesn't make sense uh, for any but the most difficult to decarbonize sectors like steel and cement and potentially aviation and, and shipping. So, um, Yes, I think that the, the federal government has significant uh, financial levers it could use uh, to both directly and indirectly subsidize renewable energy generation and transmission and storage, I should add, as well, um, and while, while getting rid of, while immediately eliminating uh, fossil fuel subsidies. That would be a very, very significant step forward. Okay. Right. And the next question, we've got lots of comments in the chat. So everyone check out the ones that uh, you can see and, and 
Um, I think there's some links in there too that people have shared. Um, next question. In your opinion, has the so-called carbon tax lowered emissions in Canada? Or uh, put it another way, is it an effective strategy for what you think? So we know that, thanks for that question. Uh, we know the answer to that. And the answer is no, uh, so far it hasn't. Now, that said, the GGPA and PPA just came online and at a, a, you know, a ridiculously low uh, price in 2018. So, you know, to be completely fair or, or to play the devil's advocate, uh, the federal government, if the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change were here today, uh, especially the former one who's from Saskatchewan, Jonathan Wilkinson, he would say, and not completely erroneously, he would say, well, it needs more time to work. However, uh, there are some problems in the design. And these are problems that plague uh, carbon pricing throughout the world. So carbon pricing, if any of you have taken Economics 101, you've probably seen carbon pricing in your textbook. It works really, really well on the pages of a microeconomics textbook. Why? Because um, the price is equal to the cost of the, of the pollution and it covers all of the pollution. So those are the two aspects of an effective carbon price. So for example, throughout the world, um, there's, there's about, depending on how, whether you aggregate or disaggregate the member states of the European Union, you know, there's anywhere from 47 to you know, 67 jurisdictions in the world that have a price. Sometimes it's a tax. In Canada, it's a price um, on carbon emissions. Now, that might sound like a lot. There's about, you know, just over 200 countries in the world. So it's, you know, less than half, but it's still a fairly significant number. Yet, the when you take, you add up all those prices in terms of the emissions that they cover, they cover only about 23% of global emissions. So this is the first problem. They don't apply, the carbon price doesn't apply to all greenhouse gas emissions. So the way that works tangibly in Canada under part two of the GGPPA, the output based performance system or the OBPS, um, that works in two different ways. So for, for industries that are deemed to be highly trade exposed, where you have a risk of carbon leakage, which basically that means Look, if you raise the tax, if you raise the price on carbon on my oil rig in Saskatchewan and Alberta, I'll just go to North Dakota, right, where there isn't a carbon tax, and that's what's called leakage. And if that were the case, and sometimes that happens, and sometimes it's it doesn't, but if that were the case, of course, it's counterproductive because it doesn't reduce emissions; it just displaces them. So, under to recognize and address that potential. I think often overstated problem, but anyway, uh, to address that under the OPPS, trade exposed industries only pay the carbon price under part two of the act for their emissions that are above either 90 or 90% 90 of the sectorial intensity average. So it means they're paying the, the price on a sliver of their emissions. It's not universally applicable. And for industries that aren't especially trade exposed, the threshold is 80%. So meaning that, um, you know, if they're, if, they're, if they're under that, they're not paying anything at all. And if they're over that, uh, the, the industry sector intensity average, they're only paying for the portion of their emissions that's above that, right? So we're looking at the worst, heaviest emitters, but they're only paying for very small slivers of their actual emissions. And that's why throughout just the, the couple of years that we've had the GGPPA, uh, that's the first reason why um, it hasn't really reduced emissions. Uh, in fact, our emissions went up from 2018 to 2019, not by a lot, marginally, but still they went up in the first year that the act was, so that's not great. And of course they went down in 2020, but that was because of COVID-19. So that's the first problem. If, if your price on emissions isn't universal, 
and doesn't cover all the emissions? Well, it's a little bit like the virus in that sense. It will go to where you know it's not covered, right? Um, so it has to be universally applicable. And the second is, and it's more technical, but there's a concept called the social cost of carbon. And what that is, like the idea is basic, which is when you emit carbon dioxide or methane or nitrous oxide or, or any other greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, um, you're, you're causing pollution. Uh, and that pollution will have all kinds of impacts. One of them is climate change, but for others, it's also air pollution, which kills millions of people uh, every year. So there are concrete costs associated with that. But because those, uh, whether it's industries or drivers for that matter, uh, who emit uh, greenhouse gases aren't paying for that, it means that the cost is externalized. So we call it in economics, a negative externality. So the idea of a social cost of carbon is to say, well, what does it actually cost? What is one unit ton of carbon dioxide? Um, what is its social cost in terms of climate change, in terms of air pollution and all the other impacts? And then it comes up with an estimate for that. And that's what we should use to, to look at our carbon price, right? So um, independent estimates in recent scholarship suggest that and this gets super complicated in terms of how you think about the future and whether you discount what it's going to cost to abate pollution in the future, which I don't think we should do. Um, but it's, you know, the social cost of carbon is likely north of $200 US a ton. Now, when the GGPPA came online in 2018, the carbon price was $20. So how can you expect it to reduce emissions by very much? when it's still so well below what the likely cost is. And if you think about the delta between the price that's imposed and the actual cost that's caused by the emission of, um, of one unit ton, then that difference is effectively a subsidy, right? And so we should be trying to eliminate that. Now, of course, this is the problem, and the uh, the energy economist Mark Jackard at Simon Fraser University, he makes this point, and I think it's a good point, is that the idea of just putting all of our eggs in the carbon pricing basket is a difficult one because carbon pricing is a difficult policy to sell. Entrenched industrial interests don't like it, and neither do individuals who are told that it's not a regulatory charge, it's a tax. It's the carbon tax. Who, you, you know, who loves a, a, another tax, right? And so the idea, and I think it's a big question, are Canadians prepared for $170 a ton by 2030? Poll evidence would suggest no, they're not, right? And so that means we need to have a broader portfolio, standards, regulations, investments, et cetera, to reduce our emissions across all of our sectors, I think a price and a more universally applicable price and a higher price should be part of that. But the idea of that the price can do almost all of the heavy lifting, well, there just isn't any evidence on the planet of a jurisdiction that's done that yet. So outside the pages of an economics textbook, it hasn't worked, works great in theory, but it's a it's a it's a political thing, so um, I think that you know you have to look at it in terms of uh, it's one tool in the toolbox, but we shouldn't think about it to the exclusion of all others. However, in Canada, that's exactly what we've done, and that's really reflected in the Supreme Court of Canada's judgment because it really just thinks based on the evidence that was put before it. Okay, we've got this federal carbon price. You know, we need to find that this is constitutionally valid because this is how we're going to fight climate change in Canada. But you know what? All that other stuff, buildings, roads, electricity, home heating, um, transportation, agriculture, forestry. Well, we'll just leave that to the provinces. That is a terrible idea. We need to carve out a role for the federal government to work with provinces to have a broad based uh, climate change strategy, not just one that's focused on this idea and isn't it great? Like, okay, in 2030, um, let's raise it to 170, i.e. in 2030, when I won't be prime minister, when I won't be minister of the environment, 
I saw a great, a student shared with me a, a great, I don't know, what are they called, memes or something, whatever, something on social media um, in response to all of these net zero emissions pledges in the year 2050. Uh, you know, it's like, man commits to stop drinking beer in 2050. Easy to do in 2021, but what does it mean? Right. I just want to say my comment, I think it's appalling that you're a university professor and don't are not familiar with memes, but <laughs> uh, that's not relevant to tonight's discussion. Um, we've got, I think, time for about one more question, um, and then that'll take us to just shortly after 8.30. Uh, how about this one? Saskatchewan seems to currently be on a course to continue supporting fossil fuel production and make up for it with a network of SMRs. We've had a couple presentations in this series about that. Do you think this is a wise strategy? And if not, what advice can you offer to persuade our government to pursue a more environmentally appropriate strategy? Well, that's an interesting two-part question. I'm not, uh, okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I don't know, yeah, if your expertise is in politically motivating <laughs> individuals, well, but. I mean, well, there's, yeah, yeah anyway. Um, so SMRs, um, so I think nuclear energy is this very interesting thing in uh, the climate change policy and advocacy space. I don't think it's realistic. Now, I should say, you know, this is, I'm, I'm getting close or I'm already well beyond the parameters of my own expertise. Um, but, um, you know, the climate science that I've read and that I read daily for my work um, does not suggest a credible or realistic path to net zero emissions without relying to some degree on nuclear energy, because if it's not nuclear energy, um, until that point in time where we scale up renewable energy, including transmission, smart grids, storage, um, we can't fill the gap or deal with the inherent problem of intermittency with fossil fuels, or we're, we're not gonna get to net zero. So, uh, and you know, if you want to look at a case study of what happens when you prematurely phase out nuclear energy, that would be Germany, um, which is, you know, going to be relying on coal as a consequence until at least 2038, not good. So now when it comes to SMRs, um, my understanding, and I'm happy to be contradicted, and I, the current jurisdiction in which I'm situated is also very excited about small nuclear reactors. Uh, my understanding is that uh, they are an unwise investment, that they are very expensive to scale. Um, and when they're not really even designed to be at scale, because they're small. And this is leaving aside all the questions about siting and waste um, which I recognize this is a more complicated and polycentric question, but we're just, you know, in terms of focusing on emissions reduction at the moment, um, it seems to me that Saskatchewan could get more bang for its public buck by working harder to take advantage of its considerable renewable energy capacity rather than uh, going down this road of SMRs, um, and then as a, you know, a more global, you know, statement. I mean, you know, obviously Ontario was able to get off coal because it had existing nuclear capacity, but that's much greater, as I understand it, than what SMRs would provide. And so, uh, you know, based on uh, meta analyses that I've seen in the literature. Um, that seems to be so far, you know, the best view is that um, let's absolutely rely on existing capacity, not phase it out, 
but uh, SMRs don't appear to be um, very efficient or scalable investments. Now, in terms of the communications advice, um, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, inappropriate, uh, but I did live uh, for three years in in Saskatoon, and I and I really enjoyed my time there, and I miss it actually. I hope to, uh, to come back one day, uh, and I'm still a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, an institution that I really care a lot about. Um, you know, I. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, some of the discord, I, I think that uh, Premier Mo and, and Premier Kenny, uh, you know, I, I really wish that they would leave off uh, divisive, polarizing politics and picking fights with the federal government, which I understand. Um, you know, I, I did my PhD at the University of Alberta. Um, I understand the deep intergenerational historical consequences of what happened in the 20s and the 30s in Western Canada and some of the profound, also in the 80s, some of the profound institutional distrust. But I think that if, if Canada is, is going to emerge, not even as a leader, let's just put that aside. Um, but if Canada is not going to fall woefully and costly behind in this transition, it needs to leave off the divisive, uh, you know, federal uh, provincial wrangling. And I, I'm so tired of it. Uh, uh, it. It happens in New Brunswick as well, where, you know, we actually have a premier who turns down federal money. It's insane. Um, turn down federal money for public transportation, which uh, the province is in desperate need of. So, um, but I honestly, um, you know, I'm just a bit of at a, at a loss. As I was mentioning earlier, uh, you know, I was part of a, a group of environmental and constitutional law professors who said right at the outset, you know, rarely, we, we never teach our students to, to uh, you know, to, to become lawyers who will tell their clients, your case is a slam dunk, you're gonna win for sure. We never say that. Even when we think that, we say, oh, well, you know, you, you have a reasonably strong argument, but there are risks, right? Because, you know, we don't want our, our students to get sued. But we were incredibly confident that the federal government had constitutional jurisdiction to price carbon emissions. It would be shocking if it didn't. It would really raise the question, what is a federal government for? But I can't say that in 2021, normally I love to say, I told you so. I don't feel that with this. I feel exasperated that we have so many provincial premiers at the moment. And this, by the way, is not a defense of our federal government either, which is perhaps the most exasperating of all our political leaders, um, that just continue to engage in divisive politics and uh, really are acting like, uh, it, it would be an insult to children to say that they're acting like children. They're acting in a highly irresponsible uh, way. And um, I don't know what it will take other than a broad public democratic showing of enough. We want grownups as leaders. And I, I, absent that, frankly, you know, I think we have to turn that question and the lens back onto all of us. And, you know, that old saying, we get the governments that we deserve. You know, we're putting up with this and we've been putting up with this for a long time, collectively, not the folks, uh, the, the folks on this, on this talk tonight, obviously, but I mean, the royal, the royal we. And I think that, you know, all environmental problems all climate change problems are problems of uh, representative democracy. Um, you know, there are no technical silver bullet solutions that are outside of, of politics. Yes, well, thank you for your candor. I enjoyed that. And um, there are some recommendations in the chat uh, for a book by Te called Tear Down by Dave Meslin. So, Thanks for that recommendation. That's always, as a librarian, my that makes my heart 
so warm. And as someone who works with both adults and children in programming, I, I would like to confirm your belief that some adults are way more unreasonable than toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> it's always interesting whose behavior advances and who doesn't. Yeah. Uh, all right, and thank you. Thank you again. This was a great presentation. Thank you for having me. Thanks again for the invitation. And I hope, uh, I hope I'll be able to come back uh, every year uh, and make an event. Um, it's, it's a real uh, pleasure and an honor uh, to, uh, to present. And I really want to just, again, thank everybody for uh, spending part of your... What I